It's our first panel discussion for Paris Fashion Week, and what an amazing show to start with because we're talking about Gareth Pugh. And I have an amazingly diverse set of panellists with me who are going to unpick the show and, and Gareth Pugh's career at the same time, who will introduce themselves. So. Yay, Paris. <laughs> My name is Karen Franklin, and I'm co-founder of All Walks Beyond the Catwalk. I'm Darius Hajjajafi. I'm a freelance fashion journalist and fashion lecturer. And I'm Norman Rosenthal, Sir Norman Rosenthal, who has nothing to do with fashion, and I'm not quite sure why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> we, are. we are, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm Rosanna Falconer, and I'm head of digital at Matthew Williamson. What's ironic, Norman, that you said I have no idea why I'm here, because my first question is going to go to you. I want to talk about this idea of fashion and art. And I know it's a very tired debate, so I don't want to say it's fashion art, but I think given someone like Gareth, he's become known for his incredible theatrical shows and he, he's not really about selling things. I think that's fair to say for his first five or six shows, I don't think he actually sold anything. Do you, what, what is this thing that fashion has? Is it, should it be commerce? Should it be art? Can it be art? Well, art can be commerce, can't it, as well? And art often is commerce. And, uh uh, except fashion is much, much bigger, I think, mm. in just in terms of turnover compared to the art world, just as music is probably bigger than art. Even though art has become very big as well in recent years, which is kind of surprising because when I started out, it was absolutely tiny. It was the tiniest little subculture. Mm. And in the meantime, it's turned into quite a massive industry with art fairs and mega, you know, exhibitions everywhere and endless galleries. You know, when I when I was young, there were perhaps two kind of contemporary art, small contemporary art galleries in London. Now there are literally hundreds, and you have Kikosian and White Cube and all those famous galleries in London and New York, where I'm going to next week. Who you knows? Just one big, seemingly, if you choose to enter that world, mm -hmm. it's like one big, totally absorbing cultural thing that's going on. But I suppose fashion is the same, and I think just as in fashion and art, they're kind of different levels. and. I think what I like about Gareth, uh, Gareth, isn't it? And Gareth Pugh. I never know whether it's Gareth or Gareth Pugh because I have another friend called Gareth who's uh, in, in New York. Gareth Pugh is that he's kind of, he seems, he seems just like Vivian Westwood, who is, you know, from an earlier generation in a way, he seems a person who doesn't give a shit. He doesn't seem mm. to care. And he does what he wants. And to that extent, I think he's an artist, probably. Mm. You know, I think time will only tell whether he's, you know, whether things survive and what the long-term thing is. But I think he is, all things being equal, he is an artist, as far as I can tell, just because of his attitude to life. And also, when you see what he does, mm. you know, once I had the privilege, I went to one of his shows once. I don't go to shows very often, I'm, you know, I mean two years can go by without mm. me going to a fashion show and then suddenly you know I have a, an artist friend of mine called Terence Coe who's also kind of not now so much but for a time sort of flirted with the idea of art, uh, fashion quite a lot now he's deliberately sort of disengaging from that very consciously disengaging from the idea of flirting with the fashion world but I went to a fashion show and that's where I met Gareth actually and Gareth I, you know, he was wearing this amazing long long coat made of I think of human hair is that possible Very made of human possible possi yeah. and so I sat in the front row and I was wearing this coat it was kind of kind of exciting it was how did it make you theatrical. feel <laughs> how did it make me feel that made me feel very it was kind of comfortable <laughs> and I kind of enjoyed wearing it because you know I'm a you know I quite like occasionally you know there's a little bit of a performer in me somewhere and uh, I quite like performing and I rather regret that I don't and didn't perform more in my life, even though once I even chose, with the help of my wife I have to ace and her, chose to go in, to, I actually performed in Andrew Logan's uh, Alternative Miss World too. Oh. So I've done all that oh, yeah, as well. That's a claim mm -hmm. to fame. So that is a kind of claim to fame too, but you know, I think he feels like an artist in the way that when I go occasionally to see a Vivian Westwood show, and I don't do these things regularly at all, mm. you just know that she has got the mind of an artist and yeah. somehow what she does instead of painting on canvases she paints by paints as it were by putting mm. material with ma different kinds of materials on human bodies but people are disparaging about this idea that fashion can be art you know there's a there's a very i think people are uncomfortable with it whether it's the public not thinking uh, that i it's don't want to hog this discussion but i want to say that, that all sorts of mediocre things go under the name of art too you know, I mean, there are not many things that really mm. survive. So I think you've got to understand that. I mean, just because you, people say, I'm an artist, doesn't mean that they are 
an artist. And just because people say I'm a fashion designer doesn't really mean to say they're a great fashion designer. I mean, mm. it's, you know, there, there are a lot of nuances and each case is a case by itself. Well, there's, there's product and there's soul. Uh, you were talking about soul earlier. There's product. And I think, yeah, I mean, anybody who's ever been to Freeze, I mean, it's just a dirty, great sort of Ikea of, um, <laughs> of offensiveness and boringness. And, um, and a lot of art, if you meet the people, you know, I remember when I first started hanging out with art people, I was shocked that they're way more snobby than fashion people. Um, they're they're, they're, they're uh, way more snobby than fashion people. Uh -huh. It almost sounded like you said way more smelly then. <laughs> <laughs> like probably, I wish it's got personal. Smell. It's got really personal. I mean, you know, and the parties are uh, often, fashion parties tend to be better. There's more, you know, just really PC things like there's more ethnic minorities in fashion. There's mm -hmm. more. I don't um, think that's true anymore, actually. I don't think that's true. I mean, I love, I, I mean, I definitely, you know, I'm not, d I don't dislike art. I mean, give me an art boy over a fashion boy any day, but. <laughs> what about girls? Take them or leave them. They're great. They're great. <laughs> but like, I don't want to like get on the bus to Peckham to bum them. But, um, but like, but no, but, but like, I think what, what I'm trying to say, sorry, um, is that, uh, yeah, basically I think there's this idea, it comes from this weird thing that art somehow is like, much better and if people mean is it making some comment about changing the world then that is totally a different thing and I don't think Gareth would think that he's making some comment about changing the world but you know yeah I think I'm just agreeing in a long way around yeah. that is it to do with criticism because I think I'm interested in what you were saying then because there is this element you know where like art is somehow taken seriously and it's put on a different pedestal to what fashion is and it got me thinking about the ways in which people review and critique fashion and it's very different to how art is analysed and it got, I wonder if that's why people refuse to put fashion in the context of being something that is in any way art because it's seen as just being about you know flattery and expensive things and it's not seen as being intelligent. Would you guys agree with that? Well, I, I'm feeling it on a different level because I'm thinking about, you know, for me, good art moves me and I can be engaging with something where I can have a response and I can feel it take place in my body and I want to have a relationship with what I'm looking at um, or what I'm experiencing and that is the same f um, when you engage with fashion that has that certain quality mm. is that you are, I am moved by something because I feel whereas I can look at a lot of fashion imagery and I don't feel and I can I can cr critique it I can see it it can wash over me and I don't intend to form a relationship with it and I think that's why it's interesting that we are talking about Gareth and what he does because I know for myself that what he does has an element where I feel it I have no mm. choice and he I think he really responds to that as well like Rosanna you and I were talking about the films that he's done and he's very much about you had a great quote that he said about the idea he said you know, that's why he loves doing film and it is about involving people in his world and yeah, he does that very I well. I think the thing about the film for him is he's a complete perfectionist as you can see in the clothes and the prospect of a show and you're relying on so many people and if a model trips over and you lose that shot of that look then that's it and the idea of a film where he'd just be working with Ruth really appealed to him mm. and um, he said also that the problem with the catwalk show I mean designers are now particularly this season finding ways to show the detail of the of the looks mm. but um, you miss the detail of each look which is so important when mm. I mean this this these, I was going to say this, these pieces of art that we're seeing in this mm. collection here. Um, so it's crucial. So yeah, he was exploring that medium as an alternative and it did raise the debate back in, um, he did it first in 2010, yeah. of um, is, is this going to replace the catwalk show, which is obviously an ongoing debate. Well, mm. catwalk shows are rather peculiar things anyway, aren't they? Very strange phenomena. Well, I, mean, I've only, I think forms. probably in, in yeah. my life, I think I'm, I can't have been to more tech. 10 fashion shows, maybe less in my life, but they're very strange. They're going to be you know, 20 minutes long, mm. the models come rushing by, mm. and I mean, they're barely over. And I don't know, I, I suppose there's an art looking at them. Mm. You know, just as there are, you know, I'm suddenly becoming quite interested in ballet, and there's a, for various reasons, and uh, I'm getting quite involved with the world of ballet dancing. 
and there's a kind of, you have to learn how to look at it. So how do you learn to look at a fashion show? I mean, you know, I suppose they are now sort of always online now, you mm -hmm. can kind of press them there, these sort of fashion channels and things like that. But how do you really, when they come rushing by, yeah, I think that's how a do really you good question. Mm, yeah. And what I think is interesting about what you've said there is that, you know, I know I've sat with people who have come from outside our industry and I've talked them through a fashion show and they've been like, but is that it? Because we've come from outside mm. and we have seen this huge energy and drama that's associated with fashion. You sit there waiting, you know, that ghastly waiting period. Oh, it's a nightmare. And this isn't mm. a West End show. This isn't somebody performing. This is um, bodies on a conveyor belt. And so it, there is a space in which fashion people engage with something other than just what they The, the reason see. why, um, you know, the reason why Gareth was amazing is that he tour you know with very little money he yeah. sort of tore straight through that fourth mm. wall in your you know i mean he had you'd go to the show and people would be screaming and people were you know and you had clockwork mice going down the catwalk you had the uh, seven foot tall models you had mm. you know i think the, the thing is sorry I, I we probably yeah the question of what's art was a bit uh, was a big one but I think the reason that his genius is that he does try and create another mm. world and he's trying mm. to create something completely crazy I don't know what mm. it is um, and you know his shows and I think why he wanted to work with film he said to me was you know because he can make his other reality that he can't do very easily on a catwalk mm. even though he's so good mm. at making shows that mm. um, feel like a video production, mm, yeah. that, that, that feel yeah. like, have that sort of weird, mad spiritual energy. Um, Look, all the photos we're looking at seem almost to come out of some crazy late Victorian movie, don't they? Mm. And I mean, that's why I think even looking at them now, I've just been presented with, you know, we're just looking at them now for the first time. And, you know, the best dresses and the best things that we're looking at have it's extraordinary Victorian quality to mm. them, like as though they're out of some crazy Victorian spooky mm -hmm. movie. And they're, I think, amazingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm beautiful. They're fantastic to look at. And I love the way that the girls are so tall, but you can't see their shoes, so they must be wearing those absolutely impossible Huge. shoes <laughs> and about, you know, with, with, with heels Great about this stuff. high. You know, I don't know how they do it and how they walk there, but the look is extraordinary and very beautiful and very sculptural, mm. I have to say. Oh, well, I Oh, sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'll just let everyone go. Um, I want before we look at the clothes properly. I was so interested by something you said, and I really want to pick up on it and find out what you all think. Because you talked about how you said you were talking about the fashion show and the art of the show and how it works. And you said I, I suppose the majority of people view it online. And this gets me into this weird thing in my head where I think about whether the catwalk show is dead. Because I think if the majority of people are viewing something online anyway. A fashion show, just with models walking up and down the catwalk, as we all discussed, clearly isn't the best way of showing those clothes. So why aren't designers accepting that the majority of people are viewing their stuff online and creating a way to show it online that is more apt? Big question there. Well, <laughs> Gareth, Gareth was, by doing those amazing films mm. with Ruth, yeah. But, um, you but know, why do people still fetishize uh, the show? Oh, come so much? on, because because it's a, it's not just it's not sometimes it's not even about the fashion. It's about you being there, mm -hmm. and it's about you know when people applaud at the end of the show, they're so applauding the fact that they're there because it's you know uh, the whole point of being a fashion designer is that you can capture like the caps you like the moment, and you know for one moment in time you wouldn't you don't want to be anywhere else. It's like when you're working you know on something amazing, you you just you just don't want to be anywhere else. You can't think of being anywhere better than in this fashion show. And sometimes that's because you've taken an hour to get across Paris in a mad rush, and you know, and it was all tense, and it, and that all adds to it. And so, you know, so what are the financial realities behind someone like his activity? Do you know? Uh, well, he Gar makes money. Yeah, he's always, there was an he's early part of his career. He's a stockist now. Yeah, he really struggled at the start. He, w he didn't sell things from his collection. And then he developed a really good relationship with um, Rekhoans and Mustafa and they've really helped him out. But now he does sell a great amount, but it is not mm. the kind of stuff that Can we Can you just go here. to a shop and buy his clothes? Yeah, but you'd buy something that is a more commercial piece. 
than what you He has a store him. in Hong Kong too. Yeah, he has a shop. Yeah, I read that. Mm. But, uh, I, I if I want to meet an English designer, why, is there a place you can go and find his clothes in London? Easily? Relatively London, easily? I think online would be your best bet in London. You, you can get his stuff on things like um, thecorner.com. Yeah, the corner. And but what kind of person would wear one of these incredible dresses? You know, I mean, if I want. But there's a really great interview that you did with him where you actually talk about that and you say you, as much as when he started, everyone thought he was so weird. And you, there's a great bit where you say like everyone under 25 loved it and everyone who was like around 30 hated it. But then you say if you look, you see all these kids now who are dressing like he dresses. And I think that's been a part of his influence as well. It's not just actually people buying his clothes it's also people adopting his aesthetic mm -hmm. and his kind of world which and is that's quite a different thing that I understand them. that I understand completely but mm -hmm. you know this this looks this is an expensive undertaking and this must cost you know I don't know is this a 50,000 or 100,000 pounds I've no idea what the economic show, of these things well, are he said it's but I mean what it costs to kind of get the fashion together get up pay for the models, mm -hmm. you know, have a, you know, the whole kind of media thing that is behind this sort which, of thing. But this is the marketing of the brand, yeah. which is, creates the whole visual um, dialogue mm -hmm. for everybody to relate to. And so in some ways, you know, putting it on online uh, presents problems because it becomes a mass market product. Which mm -hmm. you can Whereas, see for free. Yes. When yeah. it's in this environment, it becomes that exclu exclusive luxury mm. product, which then acts as um, a, a kind of energy for other companies to buy yeah, into. Well, so mm -hmm. they buy into Gareth to design a perfume bottle, or they buy into him to create a cocktail bar, or mm -hmm. so this create a cocktail bar, I mean, all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Designers what kind, what are asked like? to so it's turn like a, their that's some kind of architect or designer, design sort of thing, yeah, yeah, furniture, lots of triangles, to all kinds yeah. of things. He did amazing yeah. ballet costumes recently. You say interested ballet. He did the costumes for um, Wayne McGregor's Carbon Life. Yeah, I saw that. It was amazing. Yeah, it was Coffin Garden. I yeah. saw that. Yeah, he did all the costumes for that. It was incredible. So he does do a lot of these kind of... He's been very successful at building this idea of his world and, and reaching out and doing lots of, lots of other things through these... They're almost like a visual press release. I mean, like the cloud that. creates huge uh, economic problems, doesn't it? Because it's changed the game for almost every kind of entertainment and if you can call it entertainment and art industry, mm. it's completely changed the nature of the game. Well, right? I have to go to Rosanna on this because you're a digital expert. Tell us what it's like working for a luxury brand and trying to tackle the internet beast. Yeah, because I launched Matthew's Twitter account on the very first day that Which I Matthew? started. There. Matthew Williamson. Uh -huh. And so Who's he? I should know. He's a British fashion designer. See, I sort of showed you how you can reply. <laughs> no, you're giving us lots of good insights. Don't mm. you? Yeah. Exactly, we've got good balance. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's been. I think Matthew is perfectly open about the fact that I dragged him slightly kicking and screaming into this new digital world, but he's really taking to it. Mm. And I, when we were talking about the Catwalk show earlier, certainly from our show, which was two weeks ago now, it's the show pieces that get the best response online. Mm. And even if they might not be the ones that are going to sell the best, having those on the, at showcased in this way on these fantastic models, it creates such a buzz. Um, and the way I kind of handled bringing the public and our social media following into the show this season, live streaming is fantastic, but I wanted to give them a bit of a view that was closer than the front row. And it's something that, you know, I was saying earlier that Gareth worries that the show does, means you miss the detail. So um, I worked with Sean Cunningham, the photographer, who I know yeah. you've worked with before. We love him here. He's, He's great. great. <laughs> um, and he, before the models went out on the runway, he zoomed in on the detail of their clothes. So for example, on this, he zoomed right in on this necklace here. So you saw, saw the full look, but then saw minute detail, a bit mm. like a kind of digital recy. And then we tweeted them straight out with the new Vine app. Um, and it got a really good response and it was, you know, a, a but kind do you of- get, Do you get people buying stuff from that? Because that's one thing that I always think about with luxury brands working with things like Twitter and Vine and Instagram. Do you get um, conversion? Yeah, well sometimes I'm like, what, what's the point? Is it? what are you actually getting when it is a real mm. luxury brand that doesn't have a diffusion line? Like I think Mark Jacobs is really interesting because people buy into Mark by Mark, but with something like Gareth or Matthew Williamson, I'm like, where? Well, certainly around the show, it's a brand building exercise. Yeah. And having kind of, you, the way they, the, the, the things like that will spread and share and be shared virally is hugely exciting for us. Yeah. Um, and then obviously when the collection comes out, that's another exercise there. 
And then, of course, we could go into the pre-ordering from the runway debate now, which I haven't yet done at Matthew Williamson. Mm. But um, a lot of designers are like? doing... Are they sort of... Like, do they, are they, do they, uh, is he a kind of no, art he, designer he or is he is, a, he is a classic kind commercial. of... Yeah, very proudly commercial. In the, in the Times just before Fashion Week, I think he said, you know, I design clothes for two sleeves and I'm, I'm proud that I, my clothes are wearable. Mm. But he does have that... In every collection, there are always pieces that are... A showpiece. A showpiece. Yeah. And then you'll see the collection that's actually in the showroom and mm. contain much more wearable things. You know, I think the thing with digital is that the art analogy really makes a lot of sense. I mm. mean, you know, Gareth does sell these dresses to ladies he described as sort of like avant-garde Chinese billionaire punks. And I imagine that these women, some of whom I've seen them... Russians, Russians do? Russian ladies. Well, Chinese mostly in Hong Kong, but I'm mm. sure lots of Russians too. Um, and... Um, uh, you know, I'm sure these women have amazing houses that are full of art, and you know, just in the same way that it really matters if they can only be t even in Hong Kong, there can only be ten or twenty of them. Exactly, and maybe only f two or three of that ten or twenty will be interested in this kind but of thing. But it really market, matters to them that yeah. cool people, just as it does in the art world, are talking about the painting. Mm. You know, the, the, uh, or talking about the dress that um, the right magazine's written about it. That, you know, I mean, how many people do does a gallery invite to sell one painting to the dinner? Mm. Hundreds, you know, and they're all there. And then sometimes I've gone to these dinners and I know that they have, a, they know. They're right there, aren't they? Well, they know I'm not going to spend any money. <laughs> they, give you lot, they give you delicious kind of free food. It's free dinner. Delicious isn't it? free food, you know, 100 <laughs> quid's worth of food. And you're just there, really, to make sort of you know the old rich russian guy feel cool and do you think that's what the fashion show has become it's that sense of yeah making it feel and seeing and being seen we're mm. an industry i i mean we're not going we can now sit at home in our pajamas and watch the shows but i think given the front row ticket most people would take that but you're but you're a fan in uh, your uh, your garage if i can call you that uh, you're a kind of fan of Gareth, aren't you? So, but massive. Are, that, but, hmm? massive fan. Massive fan, but in a way you're putting down what he's doing, in a way. Do you think you're putting down what he's doing? No. Yes, you are, because you're, say, you're sort of saying it's only for these two or three rich Hong Kong ladies who want to be on a status and want to be cool. Yeah, but I think that a showpiece no. is always just for those, for those two or three ladies. Any amazing fashion designer, their incredible, beautiful, most elaborate showpiece will engage two or three women that can afford it but it's how i think what's interesting and with gareth is he yeah, does that but yeah. he gets all the young kids jake and dinos well. have affected the culture gareth affects the culture only a few people are going to buy a jake and dinos artwork only a few people are going to buy a gareth dress it's fine but ultimately people then come to him and buy into his brand mm -hmm. do you think next year we'll see lots of girls in london wearing bonnets in a kind but of victorian no, but way you're looking at this in a really simplistic Way because what we're what happens here as a result of this is he then gets a lot of commercial opportunities to do Gareth Pugh to a faceless brand, so that that's where the money comes from from him. So it's him taking his signature into a space that is highly commercial that needs that type of energy. I mean, inevitably, for example, I go down Bond Street quite a lot because it used to be kind of the art world world, and it's I, I live quite nearby anyway. You see all these endless fashion stores, and they're all like completely empty as well. You see, but you see so many galleries that are completely empty as well. Yeah, but you know, galleries are supposed to be about selling clothes. Uh, uh, galleries about selling art. Sorry about that lapsus. Galleries are about selling but art. You think and, and art. those shops, those endless shops in Bond Street, are about selling clothes, and they seem to be totally, totally empty. And it's not even just a question of recession, mm. I don't think. But it only takes one very rich Hong Kong lady on yeah, a shopping spree. Takes one sale. Your week done. Unlike in a high street store where you need the regular footfall. Mm -hmm. well, and also why what Gareth is doing um, is, is interesting because, you know, the, 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 uh, the f you know also he had a makeup range with Mac, mm -hmm. which was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Anything he does is hyper recognisable. You know, the triangle has the basically triangle, become God. his thing because mm -hmm. it's the most powerful shape, as he always says. And um, so he can market quite basic things like a... You know, like a laptop bag or like a 
a makeup range, but but um, you know, like you said, a lot of supposedly big fashion brands also don't sell, and everybody knows that. You know, mm. but can you see Gareth, for example, arriving at H and M or what's the other big fashion store, Top Top, top Shop? Yeah, he could. Th it's about you think choice he will? for him. No, he may not want to. That may not be a space that he wants to move in. But you know, you referenced Vivian Westwood earlier. It was a very long time before she began earning I know, proper I know, I know. money. Mm. And so for Gareth, there's a, you know, there's a bigger plan here rather than, it's not the just plan, about... I think it's a sort of fate rather than the It's plan. not just about um, making immediate money from something that, when you're on a journey. Um, no, but that's what's yeah. so beautiful about him. You don't feel even that he feels it's a plan. I think he does what he wants to do, he's, which he, is he's said that a thing. And I mean, I think there's no question about it. I've met him, and you know, he's a friend of friends of mine, and somehow when we meet, we sort of kind of get on, and we have a sort of uh, little bit of a... You know, a kind of uh, we have an empathy for each other, and he feel you really feel that he's not doing it for the money. He's doing it because that's what he does. That's what makes him so special. And there are not many like really that. How many are there like that in the world? Even even I mean, we're talking here about a British fashion designer. Are there are there are there people like but this in New York or in Milan? Or that, in that's less and less. That's why I posed a question right at the start, where I talked about you know people are very dismissive of saying that fashion should be art because if you talk to m the majority of young designers working today, even those in London who are often held as being the most um, most dynamic and the most creative, they will say that like selling clothes is what fashion should be about. And that's, that was, which is great in British way. Fashion Council, that was the big change that I witnessed. So I arrived in 2007, Gareth went in 2008, and then um, we celebrated 25 years in 2009. And there was, there is now, as I'm sure you've all seen, so much more backing for the emerging talent. And Natalie Massini is now the chair. And there is a real focus on, focus on commercial businesses, even for the young ones who have these fantastic collaborations with Topshop. Mm. They're sponsored by New Gen and Topshop. And then there's things like the Designer Fashion Fund for Vogue. And, and then there are all the little shops as well. There are all those little shops. I mean, I've been with my daughter down, uh, you know, uh, Pet what used to be called Petticoat Lane, rather appropriately. <laughs> What's it called? Um, you know, in, in the East End. Mm? I like, um, um, do you mean around mean Brick Lane? Hox, Brick, yeah, yeah, Brick Lane, Lane down, yeah. they used to be called Petticoat Lane, rather appropriately. Mm. Well, they should call that ago. again, that's well, lovely. That's they should call nice. it Petticoat yeah, Lane, they should. Should. And I mean, you can see all these little designers who are, uh, you know, trying to do something. And mm. I think there are probably lots of them. And I was in Manchester last week and I met some young designer for some reason at some party for, you know, there was an exhibition I went up to see and there's some young designers in Manchester by all accounts. So but do you not think young artists are So I mean Gareth somehow society. seems to have broken through at a mm, pretty yeah. high grand level. He's turned himself into almost a grand personality of the fashion world and I think for every Gareth Pugh there are probably 100 and 120 or 150 or 200 and maybe more mm. kind of aspiring fashion designers mm. just as there are lots of aspiring artists who probably tragically as individuals probably will never make it big. Mm. Well the thing is, I mean fashion's expensive to make, so a lot of a lot of um, fashion designers basically get to a point where if they don't go over the precipice into making money, mm. they, they you know, for a lot of people, not Gareth, but a lot of people you would be surprised they're in magazines, they're they're all over the internet, you know, and they're on housing benefit. You know, this is a familiar, this is like a story that's through and through. I'm sure just like lots of artists are on housing yeah, benefit. Yeah, but, but art also, you kind of have the gallery and they help you and well, also... Well, I mean, there are different galleries. I mean, uh, not everybody's at White Cube. Or that's at, true, but also... There are also time. tiny little galleries where, you know, they can barely afford but making to keep a, it going. Making a, anyway. a video or making, uh, you know, photography is, can be cheaper than making 30 dresses. Um, yeah. But also, like, you know, let's not get carried away with the idea, you know, Gareth, yeah, he's not, like, m insanely commercial, but he, you he know, he doesn't, money selling. Yeah, he doesn't yeah, live yeah. above a kebab shop on, in, in no. Dalston anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, like... But he, I remember the Chapman's living above a kebab shop in, uh, on the old Kent Road in, uh, when they didn't have a gallery. They had, um, so they'd already had, mm -hmm. they'd already had Gagosian shows and things like that, and then there was, suddenly there was a stop. And there was a kind of two-year hiatus when they were living off hamburgers in in the old Kings Road, in in, in on on the old Kent Road, mm. uh, next to, as I say, the biggest hamburger shop you can possibly imagine. That's what they were eating. <laughs> that's what they all. That's all they had to but eat. But what's for two interesting years. with Gareth is he's cultivated this view of not being commercial, and I think you're completely right when you say that he doesn't approach things in a kind of 
money driven way and I think that's what makes him so special but also like we can overstate this as exactly as, as you say Dirish he, he makes money you know, he's built a very successful brand yeah, a combination well of that. talent and good fortune yeah I mean it's true of you know, sheer say, hard work and it's sheer hard, hard work. work but I mean yeah. a lot of people who work very hard a lot of people who have a lot of talent and then you need what I call the lucky break because once you've got the lucky break then you then you carry on well mm. you know unless you decide to step off and that's mm. true of myself do you know what I, mean? I had a luck, couple of lucky breaks mm. and I'm not you know rich and, but you know I've had an incredibly successful career by my own standards you know and somehow I had a lucky break and once you're on on the once you're on the trajectory then you're fine but I think there's also a space which you can't define which is about um, people responding so you can have a lucky break where somehow somebody is promoting you or there's a right time right place stuff but one of the things for me which which I feel very much when I engage with what Gareth does is his uh, response around femininity right now at a point where mm. I think quite often um, the feeling for femininity is that it is dismantled and disempowered mm. and I always see with his approach to feminine energy that it's very much about empowerment I love that his clothes don't sexualize bodies I love that it's not all about sculpting around um, obvious kind of sexual uh, kind of physical characteristics. Mm -hmm. I love it that he plays with distortion. And it's just possible that... And you know, even tragedy, in a funny well, kind of way. All of the You know, the there's a kind of tragic element. I think we should look yeah, a little bit say, more look, carefully look at, the at these images and try yeah. and talk about them. Yes, you let's think? Because we're talking clothes. rather abstractly. Let's and. Go. Uh, and you know we're supposed to look at these things more precisely. <laughs> but this emphasizes exactly what you were just glasses. saying there, Karen, about I about the way so. it works around the body, which is really interesting to see. You know, he's never. But then people have, having said that, people have for the last few seasons commented that his designs are getting more, slightly more feminine, that, what, a bit more romantic, a bit more romantic, season, and a bit yeah. more like last season. I think there were pieces in that that were very. Feminine. I actually thought the early stuff was very romantic because to me female empowerment and strength is extremely yeah. alluring mm -hmm. and uh, that is romance for me mm -hmm. so I don't need there to be some kind of I can we escape from the concept of the projection. season, this season, it's kind of rather boring, I mean aren't these things there, for, why can't these things be there forever? I mean, It's the fashion hamster wheel. Yeah it's the hamster wheel. But what also there think? is the What do you think? Well I, I You're think a bit you'd of a have a better <laughs> answer. <laughs> I mean, basically, you know, it's it's just it just you need to because the shops insist, so they're not going to buy it if it's not a new it's, season. It's a it's a it's cyclical. It's a vicious cycle in mm. the the consumer's demand. I, I mean, if we at Matthew Williamson on Bruton Street had spring summer thirteen arriving next week and then just there for six months, I mean, no, you you the, the customer craves. Now, will this be any good in a year's time? I mean, is or is it already vintage or vintage? Well, this will, this needs to be relevant in three months' time. That's the point. Well, I know it's three months time, but about next year or in 2000, and why isn't this beautiful that, in 2014 that's what, that's what's so or 15? about Gareth, because this goes back to what Karen do as you were saying, because there is an element with his work where there's these, these really sort of iconic codes to what he does, which means that women that own Gareth will wear something for yeah. years and years and years. And I think that makes him quite unique, because he does, it's not really dateable in the way that other designers' no. collections are. No. And I think there is a kind of ageless quality to what he does as well. I can see, you know, a very young um, physique in that, and I can also see how it suits women, uh, you know, the dowager, mm. women in their dotage, because it is the dowager. That's a nineteenth-century word too, isn't it's it? It's a beautiful <laughs> word. I love mm. that word. You know, Gareth. I, I don't know whether this seems ridiculous thing to say, but he really loves his mum. You know, mm, he really. Yeah. I mean, she's a huge force. She comes to all the shows. You know, I, um, you can almost see. I've been to his house, um, and you can see elements in his living room that have come through in the shows. Mm. And he talks about his house in Wales or his house no, in, in Sunderland. He's, in Sunderland. He's, he's, Sunderland. Yeah, right. he's like Billy Elliot of the fashion mm -hmm. world. <laughs> and um, you know, and it's a. Uh, it was a. It was a nice house. But you know, in London, it was a it was a nice house, the nicest house uh, in that bit of Sunderland. But you know, in London, it would be worth very little. You know, Gareth's mm. dad's a policeman; he's a very modest background. Um, but you know, and he talks about the fur coat that his mum had. 
I don't know if it's real or not. And he often talks about, you know, I know that's a bit of a cliche, but I think it's also true in that he really loves um, women. And maybe it's that embroidery, mm. interesting that he loves older women. But that's true with mm. Lee McQueen as well. That's an interesting yeah. thing is people always, the way you were talking about Gareth there, that, that it's so similar to what you read about Lee McQueen talking about his relationship with his mother and, and looking at women from this very yeah. different perspective. It's almost a genderless perspective. I want to, let's, let's stay there on this one image. Talk let's to me talk, about this look. Let's talk about <laughs> this particular image and this particular Give me kind your, of costume. And as I say it, you know, there's something. Give me your gut reaction. What do you think? My gut this? reaction to it is, first of all, I want to know what is the material. I can't see, is it silk or is it? It looks like a silk that's been embroidered on. I would mm -hmm. Do you think it guess. probably is? Yeah, probably. And is it a unique piece? Yeah, this is a showpiece they made specifically for the show. And I'd love to see the bonnet more precisely because I love the idea you of the bonnet. You love the bonnet. Oh, I you love the bonnet. About I, like, I mean, it would be wonderful too. It would be like going back in time if the whole, every woman in London was wearing a bonnet. Don't you think? And a long dress. <laughs> I, like I that. don't think I'd like that if you everyone like in that. London was. Get I don't want to go back in time. Sla get rid of those kind of denims and things like that. I mean, the death of denim would be quite a wonderful moment, wouldn't it? And if that were to happen, you, could you see... Do you want to have denim? to wear a top hat every day, though? What? Do you want to have to wear a top hat every day? I wouldn't mind, yeah. Okay, fine. I bought a top hat. As long as it's equal. I bought a top hat for when, you know, when I went to Buckingham Palace. And okay. I've only worn it then. I've only carried it then. But I wouldn't mind wearing a top hat. It'd be rather wonderful. Well, I'll wear a bonnet and you can wear a top hat. But do you think <laughs> everybody wore one? Do you think it would be fantastic? Or not? Where what do, do you stand on this? Oh, uh, uh, top hats. Yeah? Would you wear a top hat? Uh, no, because it's really stiff. But I mean, yeah, I'm all for you know, I'm all for uh, dressing individuality, up. Oh. Individuality. Yeah. I mean, generally, you know, I have a bit of a weird problem because I'm a bit of a minimalist. But would you like would you like a world where, where you know you walked out of the studio yeah, and you walked out into the street and or indeed walked in a street in Manchester or Sunderland and saw lots of people but that's like not, that? But that's not what this is about, though. It's not about mm. everyone wearing this. It's everyone buying in. Not even buying in, that sounds too commercial. It's a kind of vision of the world, isn't it? It's everyone identifying with a little bit, but that, that could be some kid in like Brighton doing her eye makeup like that. Mm. I think what Norman's sort of getting at, though, is quite interesting, because again, let's put, like, go to Sunderland. It's really, like, I remember going and there was this advert for DHL, and it had a picture of China, and it really was like, China's amazing, Sunderland's not. Um, and you know, and I think it's interesting if this much drama was, if, imagine if we did go out onto the street and perhaps not such amazing, imagine if people were dressing with this much drama and energy, wouldn't it be fantastic if we sort of freed but fashion? But don't you and think supposing the fashion show took place in Sunderland on film and it was, it was kind of streamed from Sunderland or from somewhere like that, from <laughs> Manchester or but that's from interesting uh, Newcastle or somewhere like that. There's an element of this being born out of the mundane nature of how people probably, I don't want to insult Sunderland, but there's you an element why this is we so live magical. In this little, you know, we live, I, mean, I happen to live, and you know, quite a lot of us live in this kind of little hothouse two square mile in London, and there's this kind of hothouse two square mile in Paris, mm. and the rest of the world is living a very, very, very different life. But and some of uh, the best designers you know, come so from that. It's a he comes from there, I know, but I mean, how can it go back there to somehow to inject, inject that world somehow with something of that, not only confidence, but something of that poetry and even tragedy? Because I think these clothes are somehow feel slightly tragic to me. Do you know mm. what I mean? Is I think we also wrong? need to look at the, um, the separates mm. because the, I have seen jackets and coats, which I can just imagine one of us wearing here this evening. Mm. Um, and the problem is that it's all quite dark, I can't really distinguish, but I think it's often the separates and designers, um, you know, young designers who are being given mentoring, for example, for the design of fashion brand or new gen are encouraged to look into separates because they are so sellable. Mm. And like, exactly, look at that coat. That's a very accessible look. Yeah, exactly. You could yeah, see and the trousers like are that. very... And the trousers, exactly. The trousers are perfect and everything about mm. it is fine and... Uh, that's wonderful. Is That's she wearing a bonnet again? But she looks. She she's got a veil, I think. But she's wearing something wrong. The one he's going to send you one of these bonnets. I can feel. Uh, yeah. It's all you want. Well, one of the things that he he's mentioned uh, again was his mum going out on a night out, and I think you know that would coincide with sort of the height of Dynasty and Dallas's fashion influence, yeah. and I think there was then um, a drama 
uh, you know, I think one of the things with Sex in the City that obviously was massively influential was it was quite boring, that kind of Mark, by Mark Jacobs influence was quite boring and you now see it watered down in a kind of like footballer's wife thing on the streets. Let's hold this image. I mean, you say this is not yeah. sexual. I think these are incredibly sexually kind of charged. Sexualized. Images. Yeah, sexualized well, images. Yeah. I think this not is only because of the face, not because of the girl. This is power dressing. This, this mm. isn't about reducing a woman, a woman, a mm. woman to yeah, a mean, body. So it, it's a very yeah. different. Space. But there is there is an erotic charge to what what is what what. Uh, to that yeah, dress, but it's an erotic type that she's in control. Of power. Oh, that's good. Mm. I think yeah. that's good. You know, I mean, all art. Art is good. Art is no good if it doesn't have an erotic charge. And I suspect that fashion is no good if but it, it doesn't have a charge. But it's how women are eroticized. Charge. I think that's it's yeah. how women are seen as erotic. I think. I think. I think we ought to get past this kind of paranoia of. Uh, of I'm really worried about what you're going to say. What I'm about to say. <laughs> when I, this paranoia of uh, that is sort of over, you know, literally overcoming the world of. Uh, what is the word you used? Huh? I don't know what yeah. you're referring to. <laughs> I mean, some are women as objects or something like, or I men as objects. Or I think that no, I don't know. We are all objects somehow. Maybe not me anymore, but. Uh, no, I, I think say I, that. I wouldn't. I don't think. But I'm curious as to what you yeah. mean by paranoia. I think there is a kind of sexual paranoia in the world, which I mean, we need to be a little bit more. You know, it's all. It is what it is. I mean, humans are what they are. Humans well, are what they are, you know. Whether we like it or not. I mean, you're, you're not. using huge, broad um, brush strokes here. And I'm looking at that. You can go back to some of those dresses, and, and I'm I said there up, is <laughs> there are very, I'm very sexually charged situations yeah. we see in both the photographs here and in you know the, and these both fragile and powerful women. They're both fragile and powerful. Say what you're going to say, Karen. I'm really interested. Uh, well, I, I was essentially saying that I was making an observation around gender as a woman, which I feel uh, I is part word, of actually. I think the fashion dialogue. And that's a space maybe, which is an interesting space, that art doesn't have uh, any kind of um, energy around. I don't know. Maybe you're saying you're coming into here and you're hearing this dialogue about femininity. These are on women. These mm -hmm. are clothes for women. These are projecting ideas around femininity. It is a male designer, and we're talking about what he feels about femininity, as you inevitably do when mm. you engage with this space. And he's a gay and male designer, art isn't he? Have he's that a gay male designer who's obviously very. Well, actually, uh, I'm not bringing his sexuality into it. I'm mm. just bringing in projections of femininity, because to me, that's a big part of what clothes. Uh, transmit and that's good isn't and it I'm well you just said I think we should get past this paranoia so I'm well, the responding like to what you're saying what paranoia do you mean I'm talking about the paranoia of as those the pejorative paranoia that is kind of in these loaded words like femininity there's nothing loaded about nothing femininity. Loaded about femininity. <laughs> no. no what I'm, but I'm curious what I'm trying because to say? Do when you we... What I'm trying to no, say? explain no. it to me better. But when we move into art, because I think, you know, maybe there's a tricky space here because you're in our world, but I would be interested to know whether there isn't that debate in art. There must be. Because there is. Because projections there is. of there the is, world There is, there is, there is. Of yeah, course there so, is. But that's not a paranoia. Surely that's an important Because you've worked with Tracy Emin, and wouldn't you talk about her work and talk about her projections of sexuality or her gender or her femininity? Naturally. Well, that's the subject matter. That is her subject Of course matter. it's the subject matter of fashion as well. This is about, this is clothes on the whole It's subject matter. But I mean, but she uses it very positively. If you're a woman's she uses those issues incredibly positive. If you're a women's wear designer, in femininity in is your. She's saying, you know, this is normal life. But th but this is what Gareth's doing. This is his, this. He's a women's wear designer. So, in the same way that Tracy Emin is looking at gender and sexuality and femininity, that's of course he's looking at femininity. He's a women's wear designer. So it's not a remotely loaded word when you're talking about a women's wear designer. In the way it's not a loaded word when you're looking at Tracy Emin. It's the same thing. What you were mentioning about Sex and the City earlier, and then you mentioned footballers' wives. <laughs> I think maybe it's the footballers' wives style of like the bodycon and the platforms, and that 
we, we've, we all feel looking at this, what a lovely contrast. Mm. And it's a huge yeah, contrast. It's not feminine, being but it's still, it's feminine, but it's kind of still fierce, as Tyra Banks might say. Yeah. And very and they, theatrical, too. Yeah, and, yeah. and very it's theatrical. Not, very and theatrical. I can see how Karen might think that that footballer's wife style of dressing is certainly, it's just, yeah. It's, it's just horrible, yeah. anyway. That's yeah. just it's horrible. It's just ugly. aesthetically <laughs> ugly. Yeah. But, but so many designers were doing body corners. And this is aesthetically yeah. not ugly. It but is in a way, beautiful. let's just take this, just what you just said there was so many designers were doing body con and they were doing it in a way with craft and taste mm. and projection. Um, but in, act in actual fact, we lost Mike here. That would be all right. Um, but then the high street kind of disseminated those codes and it percolated outward, outwards and it actually became so diluted mm. that we lost everything. To me, when this percolates outwards as it does, it, there, there isn't something that, you know, it doesn't lose in the same way because yeah. it has such respect in the first place for silhouette, for, um, you know, the shape, I the shape as well. I think, I think what's interesting is that he definitely has struggled, hasn't he? Because he's so trademarked and was so responsible for exploding the whole architectural Amazon mega Sasha. You know, he reinvented Beyonce. I mean, mm. this is a guy that's changed the world. Um, he reinvented Beyonce as Sasha Fierce through his clothes. And what's interesting is that architectural sexuality somehow becomes trashy very easily. There's this amazing golden point where it should be the opposite of trash. It's amazingly sophisticated. Mm. And then it becomes trashy. And what's great is, you know, I've seen a few of his softer, more flowing collections and uh, people who wear women's fashion love them. Uh, you know, me being interested just in the sort of ideas, I'm less into them. And now this is a really successful collection because he seems to be doing something that's soft but got that sharp yeah, design completely. at the same time. Look at that. Can we s stick to the one before? Go to the one before, the for one example. Before that. Can we go to the one before? There we go. And don't you love the way that? I mean, I love. Cinch is the I mean, it's in beautifully kind of shaped material, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's just in the way it clings to the body is amazingly just attractive and beautiful, mm -hmm. aesthetically beautiful. And that's not a. Is that a, an objectionable remark or not? No, I'm fine with why, that. Why do you think that? I don't know. I mean, I'm just wondering whether <laughs> you know, one has to use one's language. So, you know, in the end, the thing about art and even fashion, high fashion, and I mean, talk about high fashion, and it's clear that Gareth belongs to this world of very high fashion, high fashion. at that point where it does become art. It becomes a language in itself where words aren't very happy. And, you know, we easily fall, in, we all easily fall into kind of simplistic words that don't really describe what's going on. Mm. And, That's know, actually whole, a really interesting point with fashion because whole, I think it's so hard. You know, they are very erotic in a good way. I mean, they're beautiful to watch. Mm. And, you know, very the same, the same thing. Yeah. I think you both agree, really. Maybe I'm using words badly. I'm You're sorry. You're such a piece. Of <laughs> 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 it's just like cause you two have sort of had an argument when you're, really, when you're not really arguing about anything. It's like agree. a child in a divorce party. You, <laughs> you can imagine him being the most in made making a wonderful, you know, you know, some film director ought to pick him up to make. Well, they the most do. Ruth Hogan film. makes yeah. amazing I mean, films. A film, a big <laughs> film director should pick him up and do costumes. Do, do costumes. So I think that the Ruth. I wanted to talk about Ruth because, you know, the other thing about Gareth is, you know, where did he come from? Well, yeah, he had this extraordinary rise, but then he came into, uh, you know, the Wow Wow, which was, you know, um, a self-selecting group of kids at the time, 20 years old, 21 years old, who lived in a squat, built a 50 foot tall Karl Lagerfeld, mm. you know, with this fantastic tribe of people that made each other f famous because they'd all talk about each other and he still works with those people. Katie Shillingford was mm. one of them, uh, Matthew Stone who does his music, who Alex obviously Box, is who does a his makeup, he's Alex, with that Alex um, Matthew who's obviously a big deal in the art world, um, you know his knitwear used to be done by Craig Lawrence who's also part of the world mm. and I think that's quite interesting that he you know, and they brought up these people and it kind of gave them the strength. They already had an audience and they already had approval. So it gave each of them the strength to be weird. Mm. 
Mm. And, and so Gareth has this like endless sort of stream of ideas because he can be quite weird and mm. be quite off. And he kind of has this security, um, you know, of, of they were this own little ecosystem. Mm. And I think that's, that was quite interesting how they came up like I that. think it's mm. brought him a lot of freedom, I think, as well, having those incredibly strong, supportive, both creatively and personally, mm. I'm sure, relationships to be able to push his ideas in such a in such a sort of exciting dynamic way that he does because he's not having it almost takes him out of that cycle of chopping and changing each season Were you part of that world I, I was just mates with them but that you what you flagged this. up I think is really important because that is also a space in which his thinking was endorsed and supported mm. and that's one of the tricky things I think when you're trying to broker um, a new aesthetic or a different mm. kind of energy it can be a lonely place in which you can doubt yourself and to have a group of people who are there also to kind of drive but that was, energy it's with you. It's always been the case actually since you know individually in in art and culture in all cultures I mean re since the Renaissance I mean you know, young people come together okay they support each other and it's nothing new, you mm. know, when Picasso was there with Braque and then they went their different ways, you know, I mean, and that was true uh, with Raphael and Michelangelo and uh, Leonardo. I mean, they were sort of, they, they knew about each other and they went off in their different ways when they got rich and famous. But Do you still see that in the art world today? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what do you think uh, the great success of the YBAs was that they were together? together they yeah. were supporting each other, dare I say, even sleeping amongst each other, all that kind of thing. These things they push through and then they make their individual careers but when you're young that's unbelievably important mm. and do that's true in America with the pop generation with the mm. abstract expressionists with you know I mean you, you just just goes on and on and on mm. it's always it was ever thus and there's nothing new about it but, it's but I mean it doesn't always happen though it doesn't happen in every generation so sometimes you know a great generation comes on becomes so powerful like for example in London in the in the in an English context the YBAs that it's taken a very long time and perhaps it's still what you want their kind of power is still so strong even now that it makes it very different for, for the another. next generation within that world to kind of make through so you may have to wait you know you have to kind of jump over and then another you know, inevitably in the next 10 15 years all things being equal i think you know there'll be another great generation of english mm -hmm. artists who artists in this country will do something totally new and unlike anything that's ever been seen before well gareth was allowed to come through precisely because there was exactly enough space mm -hmm. i found growing up or you know i was caught a bit stuck i was just connected to the end of that kind of jefferson katie grand mm -hmm. era and it was all the energy had kind of died, mm. you know, and then these guys came along and I, mm. I said to Matthew, I said, oh, thank God I can get old now because I finally <laughs> feel like my mm. youth has kind of happened, even though they're sort of two, three years younger than me. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, because there was a gap, you know, there wasn't really anything going on in London and he was allowed to sort of become this big mm. thing in a way mm. because there was, you know, everybody interesting had gone. Had yeah. gone, yeah. Um, he, he marked the renaissance, really, of it all. And then Christopher Kane, and then Adam, mm. and then people coming back. And now he's controlling, like now I it. suspect mm. he's kind of controlling the space for a little bit longer. And then there'll, it'll be some time before a new thing comes up. I don't know. Well, Lulu Kennedy as well. I mean, she, yeah. she, she mm. you know, he had a fashion show before um, Cash Point, but, you know, Lulu Kennedy, Jonathan yeah. Saunders, I mean, it was Lulu that kind of... She's with her fashion East scheme, which she's is still going so I don't so know strong. at all, I'm afraid. She's, she's, she's an amazing young... Yeah. yeah, you explain, because you, you know about her beauty. Lulu's just a you're great... Go, you're, um, all, you're all going to have to educate me. She spots me. the talent, <laughs> and she, na she mentors them, and she has she's a She's got a, letters a great after a name like you. <laughs> She has actually, yeah. and she's met the Queen. Yeah, she's mm. met the Queen too. Yeah, there are one or two people like that in the art world too. Mm. Uh, Shall we look at some yeah. more of the fashion? who kind of are incredible good talent spotters and then they they don't actually make any money out of it and then suddenly the people they spot fly so away, they, fly they, away. they fly away let's have a look at the next look a wonderful woman in New York called Clarissa Dalrymple do you know about her? No. check her out she's rather extraordinary An amazing career of kind of spotting artists who then go you know 
but she doesn't. She has no money. It worries me with fashion, though, because I always talk about this on the panels, but I think there's just not the, the space apart from something like Fashion East, which is incredibly supported. Yeah. And Lulu's obviously done an amazing job, but everyone supports her so much, but there's well, not that space East? for that to happen. Yeah, That's what the scheme we were this, talking about. Um, each season there is a Fashion East show at London Fashion Week, and it usually has three designers. And it is a, 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 so many of these And they're sponsored, to be honest. Yeah, they're sponsored. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're but there has sponsored. been, I mean, there's been on-off for 10 years, mm-hmm. and that had an incredible mentoring scheme. And I know that Vauxhall Fashion Scout have stepped in to kind of pick up that space in order to be not just a, a showcasing uh, platform, but also to be mentoring young sort of creatives who actually don't know how to sort out um, business plan and mm-hmm. cash flow and all of those tricky spaces mm-hmm. and it's even, empty. you know, c- sort of um, combining, you know, PR with, um, you know, their their approach um, at the right time because mm-hmm. there's no point having PR too soon or, um, you know, it's, it's about getting the things in the right order. And I think all of those um, uh, energies are to a certain extent struggle themselves to make it happen mm-hmm. because they're all dependent on on sponsorship so mm. you know it is a tough space which we you know we bring it back to Gareth which is why he is spectacular because he's done it on his own terms and he has done it in an incredibly difficult climate and a difficult time mm. and he has you know we're talking about there being a kind of a, a coterie of people there's the the sp- the, um, the importance of having a shorthand in which you don't have mm. to explain yourself mm. and your ideas and everybody gets it and everybody Sometimes wants bad times Gareth the best things. I agree with that. You know, I mean, so there's a first. People forget, <laughs> people forget that, for example, you know, the time of the way, in, in the YBA time was yes. a pretty hard time in mm. London. You know, there was that big recession at that point in mm. the very late 80s, early 90s, yeah. maybe not as mega as it seems to be now mm. but at the time it seemed to be pretty desperate and difficult and I think the punk era also came out of that kind of thing and many you know many different things mm. you know these things are much more things that you know don't the uniqueness of things every generation in reinvents itself and it finds its heroes and uh, for whatever reason and you know he's obviously clearly going to be a hero of his generation but he's a very that you won't, one as that well. you won't be able to write out of the history of his metier so mm. quite clearly because he's already made that huge impact and uh, so he's there and, and everybody and wants him to continue yeah. you know he's a he's a precious yeah. energy so and true. we've seen what's happened to some of our precious energies when they are corporatized and pulled into a system and their output becomes very f- and that's hysterical. Form- formulaic and, and above all hysterical too this kind of clear kind of pressure of producing you know two shows a year and are basically chasing your tail all that mm. kind of thing. and i suspect um, I just guess again by just knowing him a little bit that he's not that kind of person who will fall for that quite so easily. Would you mm. agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's. I know, you know, in the past he's he's turned down things that weren't great for him, and you know, um, mm. I think he's got a real. You know, he's really got his head screwed on. He, you know, he was very very young when he started, and he's always mm. had a great business head, um, and he's got a gr- an amazing work ethic mm-hmm. and I think you know I mean he is like the perfect fashion designer isn't mm. he you know like mm. he's like everything you kind of want a fashion want, designer yeah. to do. He's I quite want to laid talk back about this look because this has been he's very, la- he's yeah. very laid yeah. back yes. with you. And this is bin bags. It's well, amazing. This look is made out of bin bags, which are like torn. Yeah, but it doesn't look like it on that no, photograph. I mean, the photographs, like of course, don't really tell you what's going on. It's incredible. We were looking at a close up though before, mm. and even on a little close up, they still don't look like bin bags. And no. somebody compared it to a black crow, and it has the same sheen that a black crow would have on its. It looks feathers. like oil. On it does. Yeah. It's amazing. And you can see it's not. It's not just black. There are greens in there too. It's um. Mm. It's incredible. An interesting fact. Is, uh, that must be Ben Bags on the yeah, what in there? But you know, to be able to create See, I can't those read Ben Bags in those photographs. Can you? <laughs> Not properly. Can you? What were you going to say? <laughs> I was going to say to be able to create those kind of contrasts with something that looks, um, you know, so powerful mm. and yet yeah, it relies on something so 
um, you know, civilian, so every day, so bottom of the pile, the black bin bag. You know, I love so that, and that's, mm. that's very London, isn't mm. it? Mm. You, I can't imagine um, any other nationality being able to channel that kind of upcycling. <laughs> And that um, goes back to the Sunderland thing, doesn't it? You know, yeah. it's finding beauty in the most mundane mm. and unexciting places, and which is something... People have made you know, clothes out of cardboard before. Mm. So in that sense, you know. But, but I think it's quite brave look, to I do think it look at the Paris. success yeah. there. Yeah, in Paris and at this time, you, know, that you say people have made clothes out of cardboard, but there is a sense where we all yawn at that now, mm. you know. But we're not yawning at this, it doesn't seem... Familiar. Well, and to me, it looks unbelievably rich, and yeah. in these mm. photographs, look unbelievably luxurious, mm. don't they? I mean, they yeah. look like. Yeah, I love it. I I find that you know I am. I'm Are you telling me all that's been bad, sir? I think it is, but you don't have to know yeah. that concept for it to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. mm. Whereas sometimes when people make, and the sound, we're missing yeah. out on the, yeah, sound. the sound. Can you yeah, imagine the sort of? Kind of amplified noise. You know, I went to beautiful. You know, I, I went. I went to beautiful theatrical performance the other night given by uh, by Bob Wilson. This so-called lecture on nothing by John Cage. You know, the whole stage was just sort of screwed up bits of paper and uh, a few. And it was fantastic set, beautifully lit. You know, obviously mm. the lighting mm. is awfully important. Definitely. Etc. Mm. You know, it's amazing what you can do with nothing in a way. But Gareth and creates a mood very well with his shows. You know, they are a piece of performance, whether it's the set yeah. design theater. or the maker. It's theatre. Yeah. And that's nothing mm. wrong with that. And that's he's that's working with Simon Costin, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. And people yeah. sometimes say art's not theatre, but of course art is theatre mm. too. It's mm. all illusion and it's all very kind of fragile. I'm going to give that a little clap. Yeah, that's us go like that. I think I think we should. I think we've had a very interesting and very volatile but Fabulous what? debate. It was great. This is what these panels should be about. So thank you very much. Let's give Gareth another clap. Yo, Gareth. <laughs>